always help me keep on track of that. How do I rewrite this in exponential form? Wouldn't that be W to the power of A equals two? W to the A. That's the base, log, <clears throat> log base W, that's the base. Logarithm is a power, that's power. And the input becomes the output because they're inverses. All right, so that, that's the one we've done many times. It's the one that you can kind of follow it, you can see it. But if I need to convert the other way, uh, how would I write this in logarithmic form? What's the base? B. B. What's the power? D. What's the power? O. What's the exponent? C. C. And then the output becomes the input. And they can just check. B to the C equals D, check. So when you rewrite this in logarithmic form, the base goes in the base. The power is the answer, because that's what a log is, is a power. And the output becomes the input because these are inverses of each other. Maybe? And then you can always check. B to this equals D. Yes, check. Yay, thank you. Is that all right? Person out there who asked that question? I got two Doug Edwards for the price of one. That's amazing. I didn't know that was happening. I thought that was sale was coming later. Anyway. Sorry about that. I just got it from no, my you're fine, school. Dude. Please leave. <laughs> Don't change it. Please leave. All right. I feel like some days I want to put half half of a Jeff Waller today. Okay. Uh, have you guys had a chance to look at your quizzes at all? Does anybody? Let me get any questions from that kind of taken care of. As always, there were several versions of it. So have you guys had a chance to look at them? Do you not care? Do you want to just kind of move forward? So there were actually, like I said, there were nine A's, four B's, four C's, four D's, and then six F's. Oh. Really good question just came in. And I, and I have said this a couple times. How do you know what order to do transformations in? It's very important. Follow your order of operations. Yes, order of operations. So everybody had something like five to the X minus three plus seven and there was a negative in front of the five, right? So plus seven, you would do last because that's the last thing you would do in order operations. So you should have flipped it, moved it this way, and then you would uh, move it up or down. So if you moved it left or right and moved it up or down, and then you flipped it, that's wrong. That's wrong. Oh. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. I got another homework question. So you're watching me do that, thinking, what is this guy doing? All right, let's see, number on six, four, okay. Oh, all right. So one thing that gets people confused, uh, let me, let me Take us back in time a little bit. Don't have turns. So I'll just talk about the past. Um, just go with me for a second. What would the what would the domain of this be right here? What's the do, how do I find the domain of this? What's well, gotta be true? Make it uh, greater than or equal to zero. Make it what? What's it? X. 
X or plus two. Thing, X plus two is greater than or equal yeah. to zero. The whole inside, inside has got to be at least zero. So that's how I say it in English. And then I put inside is this, at least is this, zero. blah, 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 blah. Yeah, for this map. Okay, well. Now watch. If I'll go, oh shit, I forgot to, oh man, this is a plus one out there. Oh man. Do I have to do it this over? No, because again, it's the in. What's inside? Freaking x plus two. I don't give a shit what's out there, right? I can't let the inside of this become uh, negative. Is everybody with me? So, there's a problem in the homework. This is section six four. Uh, I don't know. It's it's the twenty one through twenty five, whatever the shit. And it says find this guy's domain. I'll just make one up. How do you find this guy's domain? Remembering what we just spoke about, and there's one little difference. 2x plus 3. It's got to be what? got to be 0. Uh, 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 greater than 0? Sorry. Yes, not equal to. Logs can't handle zeros. I like it. I'll spare you my Jack Nicholson interest. No. And then you can do it. So the minus five has got nothing to do with the question because that's what's inside the logarithm. That's all I care about. I can't let that happen. That's minus five. It gives a shit. He's minus five. It's not inside the function. So I, it, there's no restriction according to this one. Is that all right? Maybe. Yeah. 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 All right, maybe I'll never, I'll never know. Person that asked me, is that, is that good? Do you have a follow-up question? Also, the other person that asked about transformations, just to make sure you know that we, that was, I was talking about that earlier, right? Is that okay? Did that make sense? The order it to do, okay, thank you. So at least one person is keeping up. Let me know what the hell's going on. Anybody else, any other questions? Oh, whoa. How would you find the x-intercept for a log? Would it be the same? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, in fact, I don't care what the function is. So here, f of x equals stuff. <laughs> stuff with x and this shit. So how would I find, um, like the y-intercept, I would put zero in for x. How would I find the x-intercept? I would set this equal to zero. Does it matter what the function is? No. So let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I, so let's see. Let's see. How would I find, um, uh, it doesn't matter, Jeff. How would I find this guy's, um, what did they ask for? All the intercepts? How would I find this guy's, um, does he have any x intercepts? How would I find that? And, and this is a beautiful example of ideas in math. Do not give a shit about the particulars of any problem. How do I find uh, x-intercept? No matter what. How do I find the x-intercept always? I make what, what? The zero. Y equals zero. Make y equals zero. So make this equal zero. And then solve. How do I solve this? You subtract one from both sides. Subtract one, love it. And then do. What's understood to be here? 10. 10. Do the what inverse do log, so 10 to the negative one. Yes, 10 to the negative one equals this. That's nice too. And then add two and you're done, blah, blah, blah. Is that all right? Now to find the y-intercept, how can you tell very quickly there's no y-intercept? What do you do to find the y-intercept forever and ever? What do you do? Plug in zero for x. Yes, plug in zero for all the other letters. In our case, we only have one other letter. And what happens when I do that? 
You get a negative. Yes, so it's not real. So there's no real y-intercept. There might be complex intercepts. In fact, there are. We're not going to worry about them at this moment in time. Okay. Is that right? So, so I, you need to, you really, really need to start realizing that there are ideas in math that exist. And then if I have a, oh, here's a new function. What do I do now? The same damn thing, the same thing, because that idea exists separate from what the function is, right? Is that all right? So don't think that everything's going to change because we learn new functions. In fact, very, 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 very soon we're going to learn some possibly brand new functions that you've never worked with before. Which should be like exciting and like scary and like what the shit's gonna happen. Uh, some of you guys probably have worked with them before a little bit. So we're getting into something called trigonometry very soon. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna learn some brand new functions. We talk about all that stuff on the oscilloscopes in the background of the horror movie. All the wavy. Anything else from Walmart, guys? Is that good? Did I miss anything? Oh, and by the way, uh, the other thing that this question would ask, let me get some of this out of the way. How would you find the vertical asymptote for this? Where's the vertical asymptote for this? What would it look like? Where's the vertical asymptote? Or I forget about this piece of that question. Where's the vertical asymptote for a logarithm? Well, shit. Where's the where's the asymptote for an exponential? Where's the asymptote? This one you you, you should know better. Maybe no. Where's the asymptote for this guy? How does he look? And then you can see where the asymptote is if you draw. Yeah, I see somebody sketching it out in the hands. Yes, and where where is that bottom of the swoosh approaching? The, the who to what? The x-axis. So for an exponential, the x-axis is an asymptote, and it can move up and down, right? So for a logarithm, it's got to be the freaking y-axis. That's the asymptote, because it's going to be the reflection of that. All right, so you can memorize that. You can just keep this picture in your head. That is what a logarithm looks like. You need to file that away in your brain because it helps with questions like domain. If I forgot, I could just think, okay, this is what it looks like. It can't be zero. Okay, got to be zero up. All right, so that's got to be greater than zero. See, I, I, that one picture helps me in a few different ways. So coming back to this, when would the asymptote not be here anymore. What kind of shift would have to happen so this wouldn't be here? It would move somewhere. To the right too. Right yeah, so it's kind of left or right. Of course, this one goes. To the right too. Right too. So now the asymptote is going to be here. And it's going to go where? And of course, it's going to go up one also, right? That's another thing that doesn't give a shit what kind of function you're dealing with is transformations, shifting left and right, shifting up and down, compression, all that stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Yep, my shirt keeps me going. All right, is that really that much to ask? Nowadays it is, apparently. Okay, okay. So what I want to do is um, we have, so this is what I'm going to do. I had already decided 6.8 was sort of an optional uh, section that I was hoping we would do. And I am completely fine. We're going to just kill that guy. He's going to, he's going to die. He's dead. He's out. And, and so when I update the homework sheet, which hopefully, let me just say, I will have it done by Monday. If I don't have it done by Monday, you guys can publicly shame me, right? <laughs> I 
I need some kind of template. So I, I'm almost done with it. I just got to get the last few things figured out. Anyway, um, this won't show up, right? Uh, 6.7, there's not a lot to do, but we're going to talk about it. There's a few nifty things in 6.7. Um, and I think I told you that the next quiz, just to let you know when the next quiz is going to happen, next quiz I have for October 8th, so a week from today, will be our next quiz, and it will be on uh, the last chunk of Chapter 6. Because our quiz we just had was included the first chunk. I think the next quiz is going to include the middle chunk, 6, 3, through 6, 6, 6 is what I'm thinking right now. Okay, so let's do this. Let's get back into um, 6, 7. Uh, let's see. It's all freaky. All right. Pull up the book here. Uh, all right. So 6.7 has got some kind of nifty real world examples of using exponential and, and logarithmic uh, behavior. So one thing that comes back is this exponential growth function and decay function. So I, I think we've already talked about it in that way, but let me just show it to you. There we go, this little dude here. So he's showed up before. Um, but something that happens, especially with like bacteria or viruses or whatever, um, you have the little Petri dish of the bacteria, we talk about their doubling time, right? And of course, uh, sorry for the gamers out there. This is not anything about any video game. But then if you have radioactive decay, you can talk about half-life. Right? So that's um, the amount of time it takes until there's half of the stuff left. So I, I, I want to I I just jump into something with you. We, we, we know this model works for this type of growth and decay. Uh, in fact, it, it models anything that is continuously growing or continuously decaying um, at a constant multiplicative rate. So, looking at that equation, let me stop sharing that bad boy. I just want to be up today, I think. All right. So, I've got this guy here. This will tell me, let's see if you guys either have a book up and you can read or you remember. What was the A naught? That's how to say this. You guys know how to say the A naught. What was that representing? Value at time zero. Yes, the initial value. So it could be the amount of the bacteria that I dump into this Petri dish, right? And then of course I turn my back on it to get the movie going, things happen. Um, K is very interesting. K is related to the, the growth or the decay rate. And of course T just means what it always has meant, the amount of time in whatever units. So let's say that I have some bacteria. And I notice that they double after 20 minutes. The population size doubles after 20 minutes. Can we figure out what K is? Now, this feels like I haven't given you enough information, but I have given you everything you got to know. Believe it or not. So, so one thing I didn't talk about was, what does Y mean? So if I plug a time and I do all this shit, what does Y represent? The amount of bacteria that's present after a certain amount of time. Beautiful, exactly, right? So you might look at this and say, I haven't given you enough information. I have no idea how many bacteria there were to begin with, so how the shit would I know this so I can solve for, for K? What's going to go in for T, obviously? 
the amount of time? Yeah, so I'm gonna go 20 minutes there. So that's that part's new. But who knows what I could do if, if, if it doubles after 20 minutes, it doesn't matter how much was there. So how much was there at the beginning? That, that's all I know. How much is there after 20 minutes? So what, what am I gonna put here? So if I put A naught E to the K times 20, how much has to be here? Because what happens after 20 minutes? It doubles. Or where was it at the beginning? A naught. So how much is there now? Two A naught? Yes, twice A naught. So what happens to the A naught? Cancels. I like it. Now, another way to look at that is to realize that this is kind of like the multiplier of this. So if I say there are twice as much as there's where to start with, doesn't that mean that this equals two? Isn't that what we just got? That's another way to look at it, but this is the classic way to do it. And now how the shit do I solve for K? Let me write this, what we got down up here. So I got some more room on my tiny little whiteboard. All right, how do you solve for K? Natural log of both sides. Yes, you take the natural log. What happens here? It cancels. Yeah. So the natural log of two equals 20K, and then I just divide by K equals natural log of two. Kick ass. So, in fact, that would have happened. Think, what would the only difference be if I would have said, well, actually, I meant it doubles after 50 minutes? What would be the only change? I mean, where'd the two come from? What the two still, the double is where the two came from, right? And, and the work I did would be the same work. The only thing that would change, if I said, oh, shit, I meant 50 minutes, what's the only thing that would change? The denominator. Yeah. So, so in general, I can't even remember if the book tells you this. In general, uh, if doubling time is D, get out of there, then K equals the natural log of two over D. I think they say that in there somewhere. Same thing with half-life, we'll see a similar thing happen. Very interesting. So now, if I have the same bacteria, right? So I have the same bacteria. So we have discovered that this is K for this bacteria, isn't it? I was wrong. It's not 50, it's 20. We're fine. That's the K we discovered, right? So that's what's true for this bacteria in the solution. So if I did have 5,000 bacteria to start with, how much would there be after? Uh, uh, 911, why, why, Jeff? I don't know, 910, sure, minutes. So, so, this, I love this kind of problem where this part would be part A, figure out what K is, and then part B would be, okay, Let's say I've got 5,000, how long until, uh, or, or how much would I have after eight, nine, or 10 minutes? So I've got, I go back to my formula. So I know what K is, and I know what A naught is now. And of course, I know how much time I want to let go past. Okay, maybe, maybe. So a lot of these problems are gonna give you they're going to tell you a complete situation so you can solve for K. And then they can ask you any other questions they want to after that, because now you know what to put here. So if they tell you this, or they tell you this, you can solve for whatever. 
So now if I put everything in here, 5,000 times e to the natural log of 2 over 20, that's what k is, times 910. And this is what I, um, that quiz, I really wanted to make this a point. You've got to know how to plug stuff in the calculator correctly. Uh, so let's do this one together. Let's see where I can put my, put my head. There we go, it's not bad. Can you guys go ahead and try to put that in your calculator? I'm gonna do mine too, we can compare. Is it 500 or 5,000? Oh, I put 500, I'm sorry. Yeah. It is 500. Yeah, 5,000. Uh, let me see. Oh, crap. There we go. Oh, To the natural log of two. I always hate the calculator opens parentheses when you put a natural log in. It's just so dumb. But oh well, too bad for us. So let me show you what I've got in this calculator. I've got this. Notice how I just put this in parentheses just to be careful. I think it's because I wrote it that way here. We don't really need them. Uh, especially with, if you have a calculator that puts powers actually up in the power, you know exactly what's up there. Now, does anyone have a calculator where it doesn't make real exponents? Everything's on one line. Does anybody like that? Okay, yeah, so let me show yeah, you what yeah, that yeah, Plus does that. I got you. So this is what we should get. What does that mean? It's very, very large. Yeah, it's very large. It's insane. 2.4 uh, blah, blah times 10 to the 17. Yeah, so move that decimal over 17 times. Yes. What is it? 10 to the 6 million, 10 to the 9th is billion, 10 to the 12th is trillion, and then you get to the insanity after that. So that's a lot of bacteria. Um, what was it? Oh, yeah, I almost forgot what I was going to show you. So if I change this back to classic, I can show you what this looks like. Ah, uh, come back. Oh, there you go. Oh, good, even better. <laughs> I don't have to plug it back in. So this is what it should look like in classic. You gotta make sure that everything that's supposed to be in the exponent is contained in these parentheses. The minute you come out of those parentheses, you're not in the exponent anymore. That's why I like the, the change they made to make it actually show exponents the way they're supposed to be. And you get the same answer, it's great. All right. So, so let me ask you something less calculation, uh, less calculator required. If this is my situation, how many bacteria would I have in 20 minutes? You don't have to do any work because what was 20 minutes? What's special about 20 minutes with this bacteria? Yeah. It That's doubles? Time it, yeah, it doubles every 20. So after 20 minutes, I'm going to have? You'd have 10,000 bacteria. Yeah, crazy. So then after 40 minutes, I'm going to have? What happened? I thought we were going to go on a roll. Every 20 minutes, it doubles. So after 20 minutes, it's 10,000. Another 20 minutes, so 40 minutes total. Double that. 20,000. 20,000. After 40, another 000. 20, an hour, it'll be 40,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't seem to be getting very big yet, but you guys have all heard about the, the thing about it. I can give you a penny and I'll give you twice that tomorrow and twice that the next day for a month, or would you rather me just give you uh, $5,000? And if you take the penny and you double it, you actually get millions of dollars if you do that. Because if you double and double and double and double and double, it goes insane. 
and, and it really, I mean, that the shape of an exponential, it, at the beginning, it's like, okay, I can see it. And then it goes, and then it turns it on, right? It's like, okay, okay, holy shit. <laughs> so somewhere between an hour and 910 minutes, this sucker hit that holy shit part of the curve, right? That's why we got such an insanely huge number. All right, all right, maybe, maybe, maybe. Oh, let me see. I want to make sure I don't forget anything weird. No, okay. Blah, 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 blah. No, 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 I don't care about that. And, and the same kind of thing happens with radioactive decay. And there's a really cool problem. Here's a really cool problem. Uh, let me show it to you. Where did you guys go? Uh, there you go. work with me. Okay, there we go. So this whole idea of carbon-14 dating, have you guys heard of that? Okay, okay. Um, and carbon-14 dating by itself is not good enough for a lot of things. You, you, there's a lot of other things, but we're going to oversimplify things just to talk about the basic idea. Um, so you can see the half-life. So now we're talking about half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. Express the amount of carbon-14 remaining as a function of time. Well, that's, let's do a little bit of study on half-life. Still sharing. Oh, shit, sorry. I appreciate that. All right. I keep forgetting this guy is dead. So the half-life is going to be, a lot like the doubling. So if I do this, can we just cut to the chase here a little bit? Let's say that, that let me see if you guys are you're gonna be able to handle this. Let's go ahead and talk, call the half-life. So the time for it to be cut in half, the time for half to be left, let's call that, remarkably enough, let's call that H. Just because. I can't remember what the book calls it. Who gives a shit? So like D was double, H is half. It's crazy. Um, so I'm going to put an H in there for time. So I could have made a specific number. I don't want to this time. I want to just prove the damn thing from the beginning. So what I want to do is I want to solve for what K is, given that information. So can we, what is this going to be? Let me see if you guys can just cut to the chase. If half of it's supposed to be left after that much time, what is this going to equal? I don't know if you guys. One half. One half, exactly. In case you can't see that, uh, I, if I put an H in here, then there would have to be half of this left, right? That's the whole idea. So H time later, there's going to be half of what I had to start with. It goes away. So then this is one half. And then I solve for K the same way as before. I take a natural log. Uh, natural log of E is going to cancel. And I divide by H. So I get K equals natural log of one half H. Now let me let me look at that a little bit. This is something really nifty about natural log. Well, how is one half related directly to two? How are they directly related? I, that might be very, you're like, I don't know what he wants. How are they related power-wise, especially because logs are all about powers? It's two what to the negative first power. Yes, so I can rewrite one half as two to the negative one. And then what can I do with powers that are up here inside of logs? Flip them down to the bottom. No. Put it to the left of the logarithm. This comes out front, yeah. Remember that? So that is for half-life. And remember the one we got for doubling time was this. So that's really cool. I mean, it kind of makes sense. K is supposed to be negative if it's decayed. That's what makes the, the exponential curve turn around, right? Are you guys still with me? Mm -hmm. So E to the positive is going to look like this. And if I want decay, it has the e to the negative, so then it looks like this, decay. So that 
that is kind of beautiful right there. Half-life as a negative uh, sign, totally makes sense. All right, so what was I doing? Let's see, let's come back to this problem. I already forgot what the years were. There we go. So knowing this, so if, if I know the half-life, I can just put it here to know what K is. I don't have to go through all the mess anymore, right? That's the power of making a general um, process. I can go through it, and then I get here, and now it's a shortcut. I know exactly what to do if I know the half-life. So here they tell me, the half-life is, I've forgotten it already, I think it's 5730, right? Yes. So what is K then? Am I still connected? <laughs> so what is the half-life? It's negative natural log of 2 divided by the half-life. So if the half-life is 5,730 years, what's gain? Negative natural log 2 over 5,730. Sweet. So now for carbon-14, we know this is true. So if I have a problem about carbon-14, that's the K that I could use. And of course, different radioactive materials have their own K values. Um, I want to see what else they do with this problem. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Here we go. Perfect. No, I don't want that one. Here it is. So let me show you. Um, that is K. One thing I want you to realize is um, we found this K given a half life. But this is K. This is just, this is K. So if I wrote this for carbon 14, that is going to go right here. That's what K is. Uh, so what I'm trying to really get to you guys is. I could find the value of K from any given situation. In this case, they happened to give me the half life, So it got sort of a, a shortcut to find K. So now they can ask me some other questions. So one thing we like to do, let me change this Y and make it make a little more sense here. Because if I just call this A, this is the amount at the beginning and this is the amount at the end after so much time. That makes a little more sense. And if I do this, ooh, look at all that I just did. This ratio is like the percentage of carbon-14 left based on how much was there at the beginning. So if I analyze an object and I see how much carbon-14 is in it, and I have an idea of how much carbon-14 was there when it was created, then I know this ratio and I can solve for T to see how old it is. So for example, let me see if they give me a, they give me a problem with this. Bark, bark, bark. Okay, so here we go. Here's a beautiful one. Let me show you the problem. If you're going along in the book, it's on, I have no idea what page it is. It's about finding the age of a bone. sure why I said it that way, but there it is. So bone fragment is found that contains 20% of its original carbon-14. To the nearest year, how old is the bone? So now you see why. They actually call this ratio, let me come back out of sharing, sorry. They call this ratio R. Oh, it's amazing. All right, just call it R. The discipline case. Um, so this is true for carbon-14. No matter what thing you're talking about, this is true for carbon-14. So what am I going to put in place of R? What am I going to put in place of this for this bone fragment? Good morning. 
Say again, sorry. Could it be 20? Yeah, well, 0.2. Oh, 0.2, okay. 0.2, and then I can solve this beautiful equation for T. Go ahead and solve that equation. That's gonna well, be fun. Where did 0.2 come from again? Oh, so let me show you the problem again. So again, the, the if I divide by the A0, I can then be given the percentage of carbon-14 that is present compared to what, how much there was to start with, right? So that's exactly what this problem did. It told me there was 20%. So I could just put a 0 0.2 here. Oh, this, got it. It's the percentage of how much is there now to how much was there before, and they just tell me that's 20%. So it really depends on the information they give you. So there's that 20%. So I want you, this is gonna be an exciting little adventure for you. Solve that equation. Let me write it up here again. I'll take away some of this extraneous. You're showing the textbook, by the way. I'm showing the who? Oh, I'm sharing. <laughs> Damn it. I was going to say I want my computer to know when to do that, but then it's one step away from Skynet and all that kind of shit. So maybe not. Uh, point two equals this business. Okay. So the first step should be pretty obvious. And the next one you just got to be careful about. That's a big time gap. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to do the first step is take a line of both sides. Go ahead and put a zero there. You can see why we, we you can see why we put a zero so we don't lose the decimal. So what's the quick way to rewrite this when I have a fractional coefficient? How can I solve for t in one step? Multiply by the reciprocal. Beautiful. So I'm going to have. Uh, 5730 negative over natural log of 2 times natural log of 0.2 is T. And then you can just throw all this stuff in your old calculator. Let's see. Yeah. What do you guys get? Anybody? How far do you want us to round it? Oh, I don't know. Um, Considering this is not very precise, you can just round it to the nearest whole number. Okay. Yeah, like negative 13,000. So I'd say 13,305. In fact, 13,300 is probably good enough. Is that what you guys got, by the way? Yes, sir. All right. So that many years. Now this is not science class. There's a lot of other considerations for this type of thing, but it's all built on a foundation of this kind of math. But there are other variables to consider. Um, there's one more model I want to look at. I keep losing where you guys are. There we go. 
and, and this is kind of nifty. This, the existence of this function should make sense. So the purpose of this function is in a situation where I have, um, let's say we're on an island and there is some maximum uh, population capacity. So there's a maximal capacity for living things on this island. So obviously if I chart the growth, it can't be exponential because you're gonna hit that ceiling, right? So this is what's called logistic growth. And it's kind of a funky uh, little equation. It's kind of nifty to see this thing happen. So it can't be exponential, right? And it, it's going to look more like a logarithm in a, in a sense. So the function itself has no logarithms in it. Uh, I'm use the same letters they do. Where is this? Okay. So that function, if I put values in there, let me ask you that, let's investigate this function. This is gonna be really cool. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody out there has ever worked with logistic growth. Um, but tell me this, can somebody tell me what the horizontal asymptote is for this? And this is a really good example of there's an idea of horizontal asymptote. It doesn't give a shit what the function looks like. And just to make sure everybody's going the right direction. There we go. That's even better. I have an undefined number of Doug Edwards. Um, I appreciate that. What is the idea behind horizontal asymptote? Allowing what to happen and seeing what happens with the function. What's the idea behind it? When do they start to, go ahead, sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, is it the behavior of the function as X gets really big or really small? Yes, I love it. So as X goes to infinity or negative infinity, and in this case, uh, we are, well, actually that'll work too. Let's look at both. So what happens as X goes to infinity? Think about what this, could I rewrite this bottom a bit? See the negative power? So can I write it like this? Is that cool? So as X goes to infinity, what does this piece do? So X is getting freaking huge. So what piece of this dude is getting big? The denominator? Yeah. So what's this whole dude going to go to? What did this go to when X got really big? It's going to go to zero. And so that's going to go to zero even freaking faster because now it's not just X. It's E to the something X. Hello. Let me stop. So it's the same old idea. Horizontal asymptotes always involve letting X get really big positive or really big negative. So that idea doesn't give a shit what the function looks like. That's the idea. This function, I've got something over stuff with X. So if X gets really big, that piece is gonna go to zero. So what is this approaching then? C. C. Which is a good letter for that because then that's the ceiling. So that is the asymptotic ceiling that I can approach and never quite get to. All right, so what if, what if X goes to negative infinity? What happens now in this crazy mess thing? Now let me write it like this again and you'll see why. This is what it is. If X is negative, this power is what? Positive. Positive. So 
the bottom of this function, the whole, this whole thing is getting stupid big, right? So what does the whole thing go to? A constant divided by getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Whole thing is going to zero. Okay. All right. So let me show you an example problem dealing with this. Let me see what time is it? Man, come on, do some more shit. All right, let me see. Oh no, I don't know if we want to do this problem. Well, here, let me, let me show you what these, um, what these uh, what variables, yeah, I forgot the name of the variable show, what they represent. So C is the carrying capacity, which I call the ceiling, which visually makes sense because it's going to look like this. As I go to infinity, it approaches the ceiling, it approaches the capacity. And of course, as I go backwards in time, it approaches zero. This piece, C over one plus A, is the initial value, which makes sense because, all right, how would I find the initial value? What would I let X equal? If X is the amount of time, what would I let X equal to see the initial value? Okay, somebody's motioning to me. Yeah, I make it zero. And if I make that zero, E to the zero is one, I'm left with C over one plus A, so that makes sense. And B is sort of like K. B is sort of like K. It. It's got to do with the situation on an island, what's the air like, what's the food like, all this other shit, it's all packed into that one variable. That one parameter, let me be careful. All right, so let's, I, this is unfortunately the one they have. Um, I feel like this is watching a horror movie while you're being chased by some psychomaniac um, doing an influenza problem while we're, where we, but oh, well. at t equals zero, there's one person in the community of a thousand people has a flu. So, Obviously, the carrying capacity for that virus is a thousand people. So, what is that? What variable does that go in for? C. Yeah. So I know C is one thousand. C over one plus A is the initial value and of course what what how many has has it initially you're still sharing i'm sorry thank you i'm so happy you guys are patient with me or you're probably like me in a meeting i say something and then I'm like oh god please tell me i'm on mute oh thank god okay um c over one plus a that was the initial amount by the way you're not gonna have to memorize this stuff you with me? So don't start trying to pack that in your brain. But of course, initially I had one person. And I know that C is a thousand, so I can solve for A. All right, so if I multiply that up, subtract one, I get A is 999. How are we doing out there? What else did I, let me see, did I leave something out? Oh, okay, thank God. I was gonna say, they have to give us more information or they have to just tell it to us directly because we have one last variable I don't know. And in this problem, they just told us what it is directly. So I know these two things and, I, and they tell me that B for this, strain of the flu is 0 0.6030. So now I can construct the equation and I can answer any questions they ask me. Is that cool? What questions they ask me? Let's see, let's make more people. Blah, 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 blah. That's made them people in the well, I have had the flu after 10 days. All right, so, so any, any question now is gonna be simple. Because I know all the parts to this. That's a thousand. 
uh, that is 999 e to the negative 0 0.603. And if they ask me how many people have the flu after, I forgot to write it, 10 days. I just got to plug it in. And this is another situation where you got to be careful how you plug this in your, in your calculator. So let's all take a second and see if we can get this. Be really careful when you put it in your calculator. That's got to be in parentheses because it's all the denominator. I got two point four. Uh oh. Not quite sure what happened there. I got 294 people rounding up for a whole person. Yeah, let's round that. This poor person, let's go ahead and just give them two. So it should be 294. So I don't know what happened to you. Um, you might have forgotten the negative sign. Uh, what else could have happened to you? Just yeah, it was the negative sign. You're right. Oh, all right. That's sort of like a common, especially when it's smaller than it's supposed to be, because now the bottom is bigger, but that's not negative. Okay. So it, it, the, I, one, the huge idea behind 6.7 is the more functions we learn, the more we're able to model in the real world. And this logistic growth model, if you, if you Google that, it is used freaking everywhere. Are there modifications to this model? Of course there are, right? But this is the basic idea behind any logistic growth uh, situation. I could um, uh, mess with it for certain specific things or introduce more variables in there somehow. Uh, let me see, is that all I want to say from this section? Yes, because I wanted to talk a little bit about Let's see, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm gonna do it. All right, that pretty much wraps up chapter six. So uh, you having crazy Jeff as a teacher, we're gonna talk a little bit about the first section of chapter seven. Um, does, does anyone know the official name? So, so chapter seven, I, I said this earlier, but just to make sure you understand, we're, we're, we're working our way towards trig. Trigonometry. So we're gonna start, of course, trigonometry involves the study of triangles and their angles, and then we kind of extend it from there. So the first thing we're gonna talk about are angles, but before we can talk about angles, we gotta talk about the parts of angles. Real quick, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. Do you guys remember what the official name of something like this was in geometry? <laughs> I couldn't really, I'm sorry. Is it a segment? Oh, that wasn't there. Yeah. Is there? That's all, yeah. Yeah. What do you got to be careful about if you step into the ocean? It's got a long tail. It might drive its spike to you. Oh, right. Right. Okay. Right. And I can use this symbol to denote it. I mean, I, I, sometimes I'll use this. So if I, have, if I had a line segment, it would just be a bar. If I had a line, it would go in both directions. This is a ray. So this is, this is a ray. It's amazing. So to make an angle, I just put another ray coming off of the same thing.
Now, of course, how many points actually live on this ring or that ring? How many points live on this ring? An infinite amount? Two. I need two of them so I can call it a name. So I, I picked that one and that one. This angle, does anyone know how to reference this angle? So there's the symbol for angle. Look how creative that is. What's one way I can reference this angle? Does anyone know? BAC. BAC. Yes, I can call it BAC. It, the way that I've got it set up, I could be a little more direct. I can call it angle A because that's definitive. In fact, what is this point called? What is that point called? It's very similar to the same kind of point on a uh, um, um, absolute value graph. What is that? That's the what? The vertex. Vertex. I love it. Which really makes sense because it looks like a V. Ah, all right. If I had a situation, so, so either one of these works. Angle A, there's no question what I'm referencing, but watch this. What if I threw this in? And just to really gum up the work, something like that, a G. If I say angle A, that's not good enough anymore. I don't know. There's three angles angle A could be. It could be this angle. It could be that angle. It could be this whole angle. All right. So then BAC would mean this one, BA. G would mean the big one, big old bag of, of angle, and then C A G CAG would be this angle. Or what we do more often than this is we give each of these little names. I could call this, have you guys ever seen this, this letter before? That's obviously not one of our letters. That's a Greek letter. Anybody know what that Greek letter is? Omega? Not quite, I like it. Omega is this, it looks like a, a curvy W. For me, it just looks like my W. That's Omega. Uh, this is Theta. This one, you'll like this one. What's that one? Is it Beta? Is it Alpha? Beta. Theta, so, so some other symbols, which we use theta, we use beta, we use uh, alpha, we use gamma, we use gamma. Uh, and to be really honest, we just freaking use capital R letters too to, to describe angles. All right. But we're going to use this symbol a shitload. There's also um, another Greek letter, phi or phi, but not pho or fum, this guy. That's lowercase that. I don't know which way you want to say it. It doesn't really matter. Phi, I like phi. All right, so you can see any of these symbols to represent an angle. Those are our standard angle variables over there. Um, let me see how much more do I want to do. Let's see how far do I want to get. Uh, maybe. Yeah, let's do one more thing. So if I have this angle just sort of hanging out in space, let's let's take one of these angles. Uh, let's talk about BAC, the original angle. What about me? Shut up. Um, so let's talk about this dude. But let's put him into what's called standard form. Standard position. I can't remember. Uh, and that's going to be on what looks like an XY plane. So if I put my angle, I'm just going to put B there. So there's my angle BAC. There it is. I've got a little angle that way. That kind of tells me how it opened. It opens this way. So this is what's called the initial side, and this is the terminal side. Initial terminal. Not standard form, standard position. Thinking about parabolas. Uh, How many? So let me ask you this. 
um, how many degrees are there in a circle? Three sixty. Why? Why? Magic. Exactly. Old magic. You have four ninety degree angles on your uh, quad. It looks like a pie something. That's coming up. You got nothing. <laughs> Um, we're going to develop a better system for angles. The reason that 360 was picked is because it's divisible in, in a lot of ways. It's got a lot of factors. That It's also based on the Babylonian number system, but that is one reason why they based their number system the way they did was because it, that way it's, you could break it up into a lot of factors. Right, 60, 360, those have a ton of freaking factors. Are you guys with me? I don't want to use 713. Holy shit, I couldn't break that up nice. So that is like completely made up, completely made up, totally. We just picked, oh, my 360, why? I can break it up a lot. Okay, we'll go with that. And that is how we define what 90 is, not the other way around. So, there's got to be a better way then than some made up bullshit. And there is. So here's the last thing I'm going to talk about. So this, this of course, is the radius. Right? I got angry pet. Yeah. 360 all the way around. But what if instead of using this made up bullshit, we're not going to completely throw them out. Don't, don't go freaking out. We got to learn something else. What if I took the radius and kind of laid it on the circle. Become a thing, Jeff. I can't do it. There we go. That looks about right. So if I took the radius, the length of the radius, let's pretend this is a string, and I just kind of laid it on the circle. Let me stop for a minute. The, the, the reason that, and see how it defines an angle. Do you see how it defines an angle then, right? You guys with me? Okay, now watch. If the circle was a little bit bigger, the radius would be a little bit bigger and it would stretch to the exact same place angularly. Oh my God. So what we call this length is we call it one radian. So if I said, I want to go two radians around a circle. That is just me saying, I want to go two lengths that are equivalent. I mean, I want to go the length of what's equivalent to two radius, radii, right? That's all a radian is. So I really want you to see the connection. It is a length, but it determines an angle. So it's an actual physical measurement. Because whatever the radius is, that is what that measurement would be if I walked it. Right? Maybe, 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 maybe. So notice this, what's the whole thing then? How far around is this? What's the, what's an equation for that? What's the equation for the whole way around the circle? Pi R squared? Mm -hmm. No, that's the equation for the shading it in. Pi that's R. Right? So how many radians does it take to get around a circle? It takes two pi radians. Because one radius is a radian. So all the way around the circle. So let me write that, what we just figured out. It takes two pi radii, I like that. Two pi radii to get all the way around the circle. So two pi is the same thing as how many de degrees? Let's bring him back in. Two pi radians is the same thing as 360 degrees. So what's pi? Pi would be 180. That is the conversion between radians and degrees. So if I wanted to know, last thing we'll do, if I wanted to know 
45 degrees, how many radians is that? Have you guys ever seen this conversion grid before? It kicks so much ass. I know a conversion. I want to kill degrees. I don't want, I want to go to radians. I don't want to be in degrees anymore. So where would I put degrees so it will cancel? Where can I put degrees so it will cross out? It yes, on the bottom. So then I'm going to put rads up here. So what is it? My conversion is 180 degrees. So 180 goes here is the same as pi radians. And then you just do this. What is 45 over 180 if I reduce it? Watch, this is kind of beautiful. Two of these is 90 and two of those is 180. So isn't this one fourth? Five over four rand. So normally when, I, when you see something just sitting by itself for a degree, uh, I'm sorry, an angle measurement with no degree is understood to be radians. If it's degrees, I have to put that there. So if I just said this, that means 45 radians. I don't have a degree symbol. All right, so that is pi over four radians is the same as 45 degrees. And I think that's a good place to stop. So I've laid some groundwork. We're gonna do some more stuff with this. Um, otherwise, we're officially done. Let me know if you have a question or something you wanna hang out afterwards. If you are math out, you can head out. Does anyone have any questions you want to hang out? Or are you all good? Is anyone still out there? Besides the people. Thank you. Well. Yeah, thank you. Cool shirt, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it sucks that it's controversial nowadays. But oh, that's the way it is. All right, guys. I'll see you all later.